pleasure to introduce our plenary speaker, Dr. Hong Mingqi. Uh, Dr. Hong received his uh, undergraduate education at National Taiwan University in the Department of Chemistry, and then he got his master's degree in biochemistry also at Taiwan University. He went to the United States to get his PhD in biochemistry at Brandeis University, and then he had two years of postdoctoral training at Whitehead Institute at MIT. In 1986, he went to the University of Texas MD Anderson Center to become a, an assistant professor in 1986. In 2004, he was promoted to full professor, and as indicated here, he is also the uh, chair of the Department of Molecular and Cellular Oncology, as well as the Vice President for Basic Research. He's also in charge of several centers as a director leading these efforts. And he was elected to be the UT MD Anderson Professor, Distinguished Professor in Education. And he received the Distinguished Achievement Awards in Basic Research and in Education, both at UT uh, MD Anderson. He really contributed not only to research, which is really very, very well known in terms of molecular cell biology related to cancer research, but also in education. He was elected many times as the McGovern Distinguished Teacher of the Year by the students and faculty and, uh, at uh, and Anderson. So he is really a marvelous uh, teacher as well as an outstanding researcher not only in the United States, but he has contributed a great deal to Taiwan. And he was elected as a member of Academia Sinica in 2002, and he has uh, been a very important advisory member of many institutions, including NHRI, the National Science Council, Academia Sinica, and several universities, including National Taiwan University, Kaohsiung Medical University, and particularly the China Medical University, as you can see here, he is a distinguished professor and the honorary director of the Center for Molecular Medicine at China Medical University. And he's led all these efforts, really is contributing to not only the United States, but a lot to Taiwan and actually beyond. He also contributes to activities in Hong Kong and mainland China. So he's really contributing to science, research, education worldwide, particularly in Taiwan and the United States. And he is a person of many talents. He is, uh, I just mentioned about research and education in science, but he also is an artist in many ways, particularly in singing. I think many of us know. Yes, yes. okay. So there's a one wrong round of applause, maybe we can get him to sing during the talk. <laughs> And without any further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Hong to the podium to give his plenary lecture. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I'm extremely honored today to be here. And before I uh, start it, I also like to make a few comments. Yeah, so I'm extremely honored to be introduced by Dr. Su Chen, who is my uh, role model. And in, in the, also that uh, this symposium is the first uh, uh, medical symposium uh, under the, 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 the uh, President Khan uh, to lead the uh, NHI uh, presidency. I also like to echo Dr. Su Chen and the, the President Khan's earlier comment that the research funding in NHI has been severely cut. And uh, I think all of us, everybody in this room, we have to think a way that to change that because this program is a very successful program that how can we work together <coughs> and to convince government that to recover or re strengthen uh, this program to make the biomedical research in Taiwan uh, continue to be uh, productive. And by that time, it was necessary to form a team to go whatever place and need somebody to sing or volunteer. <laughs> So in the coming 40 minutes, 45 minutes or so, I would like to share with you uh, some of the stuff that we have been working on in my 
laboratory, uh, in MD Anderson Cancer Center, and many of the research projects was actually collaborated with people in Taiwan, particularly China Medical University, and Academia Sinica, and with several uh, other universities, and many of them are in the audience. So first, I would like to share with you how we study signal crosstalk to allow us I need you to Okay, so can you see that? Okay, so, and then to uh, uh, identify signal crosstalk of cancer cell to allow us to predict the resistance for target therapy and then more proactively to propose the marker guided clinical trial. And then after that, I would like to share with you a little bit what we have been doing in the past five, six years or so to develop target cancer gene therapy and then move to identify the specific signal, uh, specific signal pathway which has been activated in the uh, cancer stem cell or tumor initiation cell or whatever you would like to call and then uh, move to uh, uh, our most recent study on how the under hypoxia condition the uh, microRNA was a regular, the maturation of microRNA was regulated by easier receptor directly and if time is allowed, at the end, I will share with you in the last 20 years of my struggle you know, to study how cell cell receptor can enter into nucleus to uh, function as the transcriptional uh, factor and DNA, involve DNA repair and DNA synthesis. So with that, I will share with you our first story that is a signal crosstalk between mTOR, CNLR mTOR SSK pathway, and HR pathway. We all know HR was originally identified from Drosophila to study uh, body segment, and when you lost the HR product, the Drosophila embryo looked like this, looked like HR, because that's why HR was named. Traditionally, let's give a little bit background on HR signal pathway. The canonical HR signal pathway is known as the receptor patch which inhibits and smooth protein located in the cell membrane. And then after HR coming to block this pathway, smoothie was activated and then coming to the cytosol to dissociate the repressor complex between GLE1, which is a transcriptional factor, and SUF, which is a negative regulator. After this smoothie activated coming, this dissociate, GLE1 then moved from cytosol to the nucleus to function the nuclear transcriptional factor, turn on many oncogen and contribute to cellular transformation to tenacity and the stem cell population. And just last year, the inhibitor of GDC0449 developed by Genetic in San Francisco, that the, this is a specific inhibitor for the smooth inhibitor was approved by FDA in last year that to treat it, uh, basal cell carcinoma. Because basal cell carcinoma, that particular type of tumor is known to be frequently involved in mutation in this molecule or that molecule. So that was approved. But unfortunately, that many clinical trials at the same time, including ovarian cancer, brain tumor, and the pancreas cancer, that drug alone does not work. And there's a reason for that. Because if you look at the literature, there are multiple independent publications indicate that HR, in addition to the so-called canonical pathway that's on the left-hand side, there are several independent publications indicate all these four more molecules, DJ beta, RAS, ERK, and AKD, all has ability to activate GLE1, but with unknown mechanism. So people is thinking, why it, this inhibitor does not work in pancreas cancer, ovarian tumor, and uh, uh, brain tumor? Maybe some other so-called non-canonical pathway was involved. So what I would like to share with you is that a while ago that. Through, uh, this activation pathway was uh, identified by uh, my laboratory, which report this article by Benjamin Lee, who actually was a trainee of NHRI, and he already received PhD degree and under postdoc training right now. I think next year he's looking for a faculty position, very soon, outstanding student trained by NHRI. And also, Yen Jiare, who was a physician scientist uh, training in uh, MD from Chang'an University, now he came back to Chang'an University. So both articles indicate that we have, a few years ago, identified this signal pathway. Now, what I would like to share with you is, just last year this article 
by Yun Wang and Mosta fellow from China, who is still in the lab right now, that he actually identified this molecule, SSK, directly in China to Li Wan, then phosphorylated Li Wan in a specific site, and that uh, specific uh, phosphorylation site was actually by, identified by uh, Roma Zhang in China Medical University, working with uh, Chen Zhongxian in Zhongyuan you know, right here. Okay. And so then after the phosphorylation, this protein become resistant to be regulated, binding by SUFU, so it becomes constituent activate going to the nucleus, and then constituent activate. So one can imagine when this non canonical particle was activated, of course, this drug is not going to work. And in addition to that, in the literature, several other groups, including our own group, has previously shown that all these kinases has the ability to suppress TSC complex to activate M2 and SSK. So if you link them together without doing any more experiment, this tells us the, uh, uh, this article, which link these two pathways together, actually link all these so-called non-canonical pathway uh, together, uh, and which may suggest that all of these so-called non independent non-canonical pathway, actually all of them go to the same pathway, or even go to the same. So here, this is published data, so I want to just quickly share with you a couple of key data, and before that, I just want to say, all of, many of these kinases are already have clinical trial or either FDA approved clinical uh, uh, drugs. So to provide the combination therapy or uh, marker guided clinical trial relative is easier because all this has been uh, uh, tested for safety and already used in humans, so it's so-called a low-hanging fruit type of project. So, First one, I want to quickly share with you. When you take the cell, you treat the TNA, then you, here's a nuclear fraction, cytoplasmic fraction. As you can see, when you treat the TNA, the one was quickly going to nucleus, and that's not known before. And if you use the assistive glue one, it's a, it's a hedgehog pathway. So if you hedgehog inhibitors such as cyclopramine, and you block it, you cannot block it. It's still going to nucleus. Indicate it is not go through the uh, traditional. Uh, HR pathway, but now we use the hydropamycin, which is an inhibitor of mTOR under the downstream of M, uh, the TN alpha pathway. Then you can see the rapamycin treatment, then this TN alpha induced nuclear localization was blocked, suggesting that TN alpha activated GLE1 from cytosol to nucleus somehow involved mTOR. And then the pathway I just shared with you in the last slide TN alpha, I take care better and TSC and TOP as you was together. Therefore, we're then looking for what is the target of this uh, uh, one. So we were looking for what molecule in that particular pathway might physically interact with GLE1. Like long story short, if you wish to show immunopristate GLE1, then you hybridize to see identify what protein kind of you can see using antibody SSK kind of uh, 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 antibody, you can see the SSK was physically associated with one, but not any. In addition to that, this SSK Li1 interaction is TNF alpha dependent, i.e., without TNF treatment, no, I think. After TNF treatment, SSK is known to be phosphorylated, activated, and now it's activated from physically interacted with Li1. And of course, SSK is a kind of. So, obviously, one can ask. Does SSK phosphorylate GLE1, and as I mentioned earlier, it was done by Roma uh, Chang working with uh, Chen Zhongxian and Zhou Yuan and Zhong Guizhou Dashue that was identifying this GLE1 was phosphorylated series of uh, 85 phosphorylation uh, by mouse spectrum. And we also induce a more, uh, an antibody against that. And so here is the antibody experiment. So we take the cell, we treat the TN alpha, and you look at the GLE1 protein here. But if you look at the antibody against the specific 84 serine phosphorylation antibody, then you can see this phosphorylation was increased only after TNA treatment. And also, and it, of course, as a control, the SSK phosphorylation was a, a positive, was activated. And now, if you treat the rapamycin to block mTOR pathway, indeed, the phosphorylation was blocked. So this tells us that TNA SSK for up. Uh, Induced the uh, phosphor GLE1, which can be inhibited by mTOR inhibitor. And how is the outcome of this phosphorylation? So, to answer this question, we make a mutant that 
mutate serine 84 into a glutamic acid is more like a phosphorylation mimic. And then this phosphorylation mimic will get a serious functional assay and all of them, including colony formation, invasion activity, tumorigenesis, and so on. The after it can still be activated, become phosphorylation, the tumorigenesis. Then, with that in mind, I want to come back to the HR inhibitor. You remember HR inhibitor has been approved by FDA to treat the basal cell carcinoma because basal cell carcinoma was activated by mutation in the canonical HR pathway. But other sort of tumor, including pancreas cancer and brain tumor, that's not the case. And then now we have data, which I will not show here, that all those sort of tumor, this M12 SK activated GLI-1 was, was activated in a secondary portion and that probably explained why this agent doesn't work. And then here just show you a very quick uh, uh, biology assay that by major tumor genetics to show under that situation you use a combination therapy to see the synergetic effect. Control developed tumor and under this particular condition red zero zero one, which is a uh, clinical use drug to block mTOR pathway under this concentration doesn't work. If you use the GDC, which is a HR inhibitor, under this condi condition, you see the partial suppression. However, when you increase even more dose, you don't really see better suppression. Not until that you use a combination therapy between red 001 block mTOR and GDC 0449 block HR. Now you see a very dramatic tumor suppression effect. We've been done a series this type of study and showing that may be a way to do it. And now in category you we further develop monoclonal body against this serine 84 phosphorylation because we want to use the monoclonal body uh, to be able to test the human tumor tissue to select the patient population so that we can do a marker guided clinical trial. And we cannot for the publication we can use polyclonal body, but we cannot use uh, polyclonal body to go to FDA approval uh, for patient uh, guided clinical trial. So now the monoclonal body we just developed in China Medical University. And so this one, we are proposing the combination therapy using S84 phosphorylation as a marker to select a patient to test esophageal cancer and pancreatic cancer and go trial. So using this example, I'd like to share with you some of last several years uh, 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 effort try to develop a looks very uh, convincing target cancer gene therapy in pancreatic cancer. As you know, pancreatic cancer is a disease virtually impossible to cure. And I also want to share with you our frustration as a pioneer to develop this type of uh, gene therapy. Okay, by the time I mentioned why I'm frustrated. So the approach is the following. We are looking for a specific expression vector which allow a gene selected express only in pancreatic cancer but not in the normal cell. So with that in mind, you go to the database looking for what gene was already present in pancreatic cancer, and we select 10, 20 of those genes, which you can easily find from literature, and you can apply to other DG too. Then take the promoter, put up the sequence uh, tra by transfection to see which one indeed the promoter of that particular gene was all, of course, had a much stronger activity in the pancreatic cancer cell. Make a long story short, we have identified one, this guy, CCKL promoter. But when you use using this type of, I'm sure many people in the audience have this experiment. When you identify so-called tissue specific or cancer specific promoter, and you show the uh, cancer specificity, but if you compare to the basal level with the CMB promoter, for example, this so-called cancer specific promoter activity very low compared to the uh, CMB promoter, even though cancer specific. So we need a platform technology to amplify this uh, activity in cancer cell only, but not in the normal cell. So we have developed this so-called visa vector, and quickly, this cancer-specific promoter, dry and artificial transcriptional factor, composed of each scale 4 DNA binding domain, hook up to the strong transcriptional activator domain from VP system. So this artificial transcriptional factor now is driven by the cancer-specific promoter. Then, in the same plasmid, you have an East uh, Air uh, promoter region drive another gene, either Cifres or tumor suppressor gene, or whatever gene you are interested. In addition to that, in the three prime we engineer an RNA element 
which is known to stabilize the messenger RNA in his translation rate, so in such a way that the gene expression can be increased. So using this two-step amplification process, we have now shown that this guy, activity in cancer cell, can be amplified up to 104, but not in the cell. And let me just quickly share with you the uh, in vivo experiment. Three animal models here. All of them are autotrophic animal model. All of them you have the tumor in inoculated paper. So we've got a paper tumor now. Then after that, we take this vector, which has a, there's a B-star vector drive with the luciferase, then coupling with the second generation liposome, well, you can buy IV injection. So this is the IV injection, Kelvin, so from Kelvin, so it is systemic delivery. And it is previously already known, after IV injection, the first part should be lung. So if you have a control, using the CMV receiver promoter, we have been, many, many people in the uh, room have been using it, and IV injection, you can see the very strong positive here, which is expression now, because the first part is Take a few minutes here. Under this audio time, very difficult to see. For the local time, you can see a very small amount there. But now, if you look at this mouse, which is using the uh, CDP, CDP and VSA others, and then they uh, use the identity. So this is VSA luciferase under the same situation, IV injection, go to the lung, but you see no expression at all in the lung. The only thing you see is abdominal, which is some positive. Open it up, take my this pancreas tumor. You take the lung from here, take the tissue out, the PCI, DNA is there. It's not your Very impressive gene expression profile. So with this data, and here is quantification, we now need a very potent gene can be developed to help your cancer cell and then select your cancer cell. So that in the last cancer. And years we have been working on this field in our own hand that we found this particular molecule is the most potent. And this one called big VCL interactive feeder. It's a VS3 uh, only protein. And this one, the reason we chose this one is two reasons. One major reason is this product molecule is a very broad target entire VCL2 entire product molecule, including VCL2. VCL-XL and MCL-1 and other issue to family uh, 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 entire top molecule, this, this uh, BIK target oral. In addition to that, in the literature, it is known there are two residues here which need to be phosphorylated so that this BIK apoptotic activity will be increased. And we have previously shown by mutating into aspartic acid, this mutant BIK DD turned out to be very important to induce uh, cancer cell death. So that's why we chose this one. And now, I want to share with you a quick uh, uh, in vitro assay. So, the assay here is black color. This is a 15 pancreas cancer cell available in the other plus. The last one is a primal culture from patient directly. Black colors can involve the vector control. They either transfer with the CMBBIKDD or transfect with the C visa BIKDD, which is cancer specific selected. You can see both of them kill the tumor cell. Pretty good. But now, if you pay attention to the panel, see here it's human normal lung fibromal cell. Here is a human normal FTD cell. Black color is the vector control. Why call the CMB, BIKDD, CMB, kill anything. Kill cancer cell, kill normal cell. But, please pay attention here, this gray color, then for the b sub BIKDD, which kill cancer cell well. But now, when you put the normal cell, there's no effect, because that's an express normal tissue. So this gives us a confidence that we can do the animal experiment, so now this animal experiment, again, three animals, and all of them has pancreas cancer in, uh, uh, in the autotopic model, and this time, the tumor cell has been engineered on purposely with the luciferase there. So we can use imaging luciferase activity to measure tumor volume, and then we now do this VIK in the gene therapy. Control is one with projection. 
one week, two weeks, three weeks, you see the tumor develop. Uh, then when you use the CME, VIK, or our visa VIK, three weeks later they all have a very small tumor that, that you can choose here. But now, if you let this experiment go for a longer time, three weeks is here, when you go a longer time, control develop, CME, you have seen secondary tumor suppression activity, but the visa vector suppression effect is even more dramatic. And here's the survival curve to tell us under this particular experiment condition, this particular cohort for pancreas animal model that controls 36 day die, here we the extended significant life band, but the, the, uh, our visa VIKTT, which we call CTP2, 60% of them after one year are long tumor development. Very impressive. So, with this data, we talk to FDA and then do the FDA required toxicity study. And so now, the FDA already approved this one, and here is where my frustration comes from. FDA approved this phase one clinical trial for pancreas cancer two years ago. And our first patient is still not here yet. Because we had to, not only originally, we thought it's only FDA approval is difficult, but after FDA approval, this is a pioneer type of blood therapy. We need a GMP grade DNA, took a long time. And now we got a DNA now, and then we come back Originally, our institution had the GMP grade liposome, and now our GMP grade liposome uh, unit had problems, so they are fixing their weight. And then uh, previously, at the time when the, everything was ready, then we are waiting for funding. But anyway, I just want to share with you that when we are developing this type of novel therapy, we like to move the clinical trial, but when we move the clinical trial, because this is not a traditional uh, way to, uh, to do it, so you have to be every step for the effort to overcome that. And I'm sure some of you have this experience. I just want to tell you that when that happened to you, you have to persist and continue and move, make it work. Because once it go to clinical trial, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But if it works, don't worry about this is going to take so long, it's going to be so expensive. Because if it works, in the future it will be very easy. It will be very cheap. And so I think we don't have to go through this issue. And I just want to share with you, if you also develop drug, and have meet this kind of problem, please, as long as your preclinical data is good, you need to persist and continue and to fight for it. And with this one, and this was done by a Xiaomi Shukur Postdoc fellow a while ago, it's probably a long time ago, and now he's a department chair in Guangzhou Zhongshan uh, Cancer Center, uh, a press medical college chair. Now, I have been we recognize as a breast cancer researcher. Before we study that particular pancreas cancer, we actually already initiated breast cancer, a breast cancer project which somehow uh, uh, less luck, uh, so take a longer time. Now we have the similar kind of back, but I change this promoter, the VSA promoter to clouding four, and then we can show now in the breast cancer animal model, we have very specific target expression vector now. So again, the two animals here, and this is not breast, okay? No, this is not human. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, remember I told you that when you IV injection, the first target tissue is the lung. So, to prevent the form confusion, so in this model, the memory tumor was on purpose, you know, get a heal area, okay? Then, after that, you see me blue silver injected, you see the lung expression, you see a little bit in breast tumor. That's why. But this one. IV injection, you go to lung, no expressions, you only express here. Very impressive. Okay. So, make a long story short that this one is similar to pancreas cancer, but what's the big deal? But in this study, we further indicate unexpectedly that this BIKDD gene therapy turned out to be able to kill cancer stem cell, or we can say tumor initiation cell. I don't want to argue with the technology, but we know a subpopulation of cancer cell somehow resistant to chemotherapy, uh, radiation therapy, and many targeted therapy. And we call it cancer stem cell or tumor initiation cell. Here is a model. The red color stands for cancer stem cell. After chemotherapy, radiation, what you really kill is also quite short solid uh, the tumor cell, but this one is more resistant. Therefore, it is already known in both the preclinical model and clinical model that if you treat the chemo, for example, palitaxel, Although the total number of cells reduce, but if you look at the stem cell population, it actually increase. Because 
you call it pure, it's not stem cell. The stem cell is more resistant. And here, I just show you one example, one of breast cancer cell control and chemo. Now, total number of cells reduced, but tumor cell population increased three to four, four. This is already known. But what I want to share with you is to treat the BIKD gene therapy. Total number of cells reduced. Now, you look at the cancer stem cell marker. Reduced even more. I think there's a significant, uh, important significant here. That is, this treatment kill this population of cells more effectively than this one. And remember, in solid tumor, there's no any effect, clinical use drug, that can kill cancer stem cell. In leukemia, there are a couple of pain your blood right now, but in solid tumor, there's no clinical use for a uh, drug to kill cancer stem cell. Except with clinical, this type of study, there are many, many candidates and people are interested to do. So with this in mind, then we've done a series of tumor initiation essay, and I have to control time, so I will not show you the data, and just show you that this one was reported in cancer cell, and currently we are in the process of IND for phase one clinical trial. The recombinant DNA advisor committee in NIH already approved it, and so we are ready to go to FDA. And uh, uh, in addition to this, that we have brought back similar kind of concept uh, back to Taiwan and in China Mango University that Long Yan Li has been working on liver cancer and then uh, So Yu Ping has been working on lung cancer and they all have very similar kind of data which I think a liver cancer, there are a couple of uh, companies actually interesting to move in the clinical trial. And then the first author, uh, Jing Li Lang, that because of this uh, publication, he has been recruited back to China in Shanghai to be one of those uh, very rich uh, Chen Qing in China, they call Chen Qing, Chen Thousand uh, Young Investigator Award. So, so he was as well in the uh, So we have finally developed a way to kill cancer stem cell. Uh, we, in addition to that, we were interested to, to study whether cancer stem cells or tumor initiation cell, there's a specific activation pathway, and if there's an activation, specific activation pathway, whether that can be served as a way to target a cancer stem cell for therapy. So this, uh, this project was initiated by uh, Alex Chen, who is came from uh, Taiwan, who is graduated from National Taiwan University and now after postdoc training, now she is a, a faculty over in Purdue University. So essentially what we did is following, I mean, you're right, you're not going to sleep, but you don't have to. There are quite a few people going to sleep there. <laughs> and I promised last night at dinner that if people are going to sleep, the best way to wake them up is sing a song. Histone lysine 27, after that was turned off the gene expression. Now, make a long story short. This guy is known to control and run stem cell. This guy, over expression, is known to involve many human solid uh, tumor, including lymphoma 2 and correlated with patient survival. So, Alice, a while ago, observed a very interesting phenotype. That is, when she's looking for cancer stem cell markers such as CD4124 and something else. And then it gets to expression. She see a linear relationship like that. And this cell, including cell line and primary culture from breast cancer patient, that these are more malignant than tumor cell. These are less malignant than tumor cell. And so I it gets to expression correlated with the cancer stem cell population. In addition to that, 
that it is to promote the content and hypoxia on the element, indicating that TIP can induce this expression. So it, what we want to say is it is just to express more higher level in cancer stem cell. And this higher level can even induce more under hypoxia condition, for example, under hypoxia. And this uh, element can be turned on by HIP, so the, the population of the uh, EGS2 expression increase. Then, with this in mind, further she discovered that EGS2 can downregulate at the transcriptional level of REP51 protein. REP51 is known to be required for DNA repair. When this guy was downregulated, DNA repair can be reduced. And of course, under that situation, many cells under hypoxia condition, they might die. But a very small population of them survive. And so, and I'm going to show the data, that we then hypothesize at that time, easier to overexpression and in a small population of tumor cell under hypoxia condition, they may be able to, because of down regulation of FD1, accumulate of genomic abnormality. And either they die, or a very small population of them survive. And that survival population may be somehow with an unknown mechanism to enhance breast tumor initiation or breast cancer stem cell population. So with that in mind, we then use a non-virus approach looking for what protein, what kinase actually respond for this particular pathway. So we use antibody array, several hundred, uh, antibody it was stopped uh, at the filter, then we compare to the EGS2 overexpression cell and the red 51 down regulation cell to the control. So both easier to shut over expression and not down red 51, the least are very consistent. The top candidate is always rough one gene expression. So you can see here, EGF2 compared to vector, vector control. And remember that when rough one is a kinase, the rough one downstream kind is already known, phosphor erk and nuclear uh, active uh, non phosphorylated beta catenin. And this pathway, when it's activated, has the ability to enhance cancer stem cell survival. That's already known. And here is just a simple question to show you that indeed when you have EGS2 there, then uh, RAP1 expression increase, phosphor erg increase, and then unphosphorylated activated beta catenin increase. And this increase requires down regulation of RAP51 because when you re express RAP51 here, even EGS2 is the same now. This increase reduces, reduces, reduces. And the reason why RAP1 expression was increased was through DNA application, about five to six four of gene application. So with that, all this, we've done a series study in the tissue culture, but A, I like to share with you, I also like to share with the audience that, that especially the student and postdoc fellow, we tend to like to do the experiment, which you know how to do. But the most important thing is to ask the biology question. So all this, what we observe, is in cell line. But cell line, you can do cell line to study mechanism, but you have to eventually validate that in the human uh, tissue. So share with you that this mechanism we identify indeed that can be validated in human breast tumor tissue, EG2, EGS2 positive, red one positive, gene application, as you can see all this green color, and EGS2 negative, red one negative, no gene application. This is one example when we count it under this particular hole, 36% of them, EGS2 positive has gene application, but EGS2 negative has no gene application. And here is the correlation of human tissue. So, in conclusion, on this particular uh, uh, project, what I'd like to share with you is under hypoxia. Remember, all the solid tumor when you grow to the southern side, the middle of the tumor is hypoxia. Under hypoxia, hypoxia induced EGS2 expression. And EGS2 expression, which is a DNA mesonate, uh, uh, histomesonase, the mesonate promoter of Rep51, turn off Rep51 transcription. And Rep51 is a DNA repair protein. When Rep51 was downregulated, they lost uh, 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 repair activity, so many of the cells died. But a small population somehow survived. And that small survived population, later on, we found out that was involved Rep1 gene application. And therefore, this earth beta catenin pathway was activated and helped the breast cancer tumor uh, uh, initiation cell of breast cancer stem cell. 
survive under hypoxia condition, which they don't then develop into a more malignant uh, uh, tumor. And this particular pathway was the first signal pathway being identified to distinguish breast cancer stem cell and the non-stem cell breast cancer cell. Now, with the hypoxia in mind, I'd like to share with you, oh, by the way, I should mention, I think I mentioned it. this is from Alice Chen, and then uh, from Tai Da, and then now she's a faculty in Purdue University. Just started on her own independent lab last year. Now, I'd like to share with you a more recent study just published a couple months ago, and this one is related to hypoxia. Hypoxia is a very important process in the solid human development, and, and here is, this is the story First time linked, and we also know that microRNA regulation is important for many, many biological pathways. Uh, yesterday in the grand review, we have seen many people propose microRNA. But how microRNA maturation regulated by the traditional signal pathway before this publication in the literature is zero. There's no publication of that. So this represents the first traditional signal pathway to involve in the microRNA maturation. So in summary, what I'm going to share with you is that under hypoxia condition, we found ECR receptor enhanced binding to ACO2. ACO2, for those people who are working on uh, uh, microRNA, ACO2 is a web of protein. This uh, protein coupling with the DICER and TRVP3 protein together is known to form a so-called RNA risk loading complex to uh, loading the pre microRNA to become mature microRNA so that microRNA can be activated. And after this enhanced binding, as a kinase, easier we set the phosphate Y393 phosphorylation site. And after phosphorylation, this ARGO2 DICER and TRVP tricomplex, which is critical for regular microRNA maturation, they become dissociated. Not totally account, uh, uh, but the interaction. And this particular complex we also identified actually regulate a subset of tumor suppressor like microRNA. So on the net result that under hypoxia, easier receptor and phosphate ARCO2 and then downregulate this type of tumor suppressor microRNA, so allow tumor to become a promote tumor progression and so on. And in addition to that, this type of microRNA precursor, we found out that this subset of microRNA has this unique structure, the long loop structure. If you mutate this long loop structure become this, it's no longer under regulation. Or if you make another gene, which is original and not regulated by this, but after creating mutation to a long loop, they can be regulated by this subset of the, uh, this subset of the structure can be regulated by I got to ICER and TRVP uh, microRNA. Maturation process, and I think for microRNA maturation, this is probably one of the first type of study to understand the structure functional relationship. So that's our conclusion. I want to very quickly go to the data we have so to save time. And so, here, just quickly share with you under hypoxia condition, I go to interact with easier, easier receptor. And in ritual kinase, you can show easier receptor phosphate I go to, and then again. Uh, Chen Zhongxian is here of uh, PROMA, then work with the Chen Zhongxian to identify by mass spectrum the 393 tyrosin phosphorylation. Then, after you determine by mass spectrum, we have to come back to the lab to do the in vitro kinase, say you take a wild type, ACO2, for, uh, by in vitro kinase with easier step, you can, you can see phosphorylation, but if the mutant, this particular site mutated, then they will not be phosphorylated. So this tells us all this together, indeed, this is the site to be uh, a tyrosine kind of phosphorylated by each of the And now again, we induce uh, anybody in, in, in China Medical University and validate this exist uh, in vivo. And since ARCO2 is known, well known, ARCO2 DICER is well known to, uh, to involve the uh, microRNA processes. So then we use deep sequencing and just quickly share with you under this, this sequence uh, condition with uh, normoxia, hypoxia, Vector control and knock down easier receptor. We actually, from the deep sequence data, identify a subset of microRNA. This subset of microRNA turned out to be 
under hypoxia condition was repressed by EGO receptor. And furthermore, this subset of microRNA turned out to be those are top score, turned out to be most dominant of tumor suppressor like microRNA. And I already mentioned that all those microRNA under this regulation all have this kind of structure. And importantly, what is the functional consequence? So we make this ARCO2 393 phosphorylation into aspartic acid, or sorry, into a tyrosine, a tyrosine vegetable to become fatty alanine, so it become, cannot be phosphorylated. Then you can show that if you measure migration activity, cell number in the 3D migration, you can see this red color, it's a wild type ARCO2, you can stimulate it, all these transform phenotype are mutant form, the pink colors with lost activity, i.e. the tumors, uh, the, uh, the wild type ARCO2 can be fostered by EGM receptor and then enhance transform phenotype because you can block that by tyrosine kinase inhibitor. But the mutant form, which cannot be tyrosine phosphorylated by itself, do not have this activity. In addition to that, remember now we have antibody recognize this particular form. Then you take this uh, phosphor Y9393 antibody and then take the human tumor tissue, breast tumor tissue, stand it, and call it the patient survival. Interestingly, we observe this phosphor Y393 ARCO2 protein. If the label is high, then patient survival is much shorter. So ARCO2 phosphorylation can be potential therapeutic target. In that case, we don't know yet, but I want to come. Again, I emphasize all what we study in cell culture and all need to be validated in human tumor tissue. He just showed you the validation of human tumor tissue. And here I want to just go through the take home lesson again. Under hypoxia, ID increase, phosphorylate, block this one, and therefore regulate a tumor suppressor like a microRNA. I want to call your attention. Colon cancer and breast cancer have a very significant difference in clinical. Both type of cancer have easier receptor overexpression. And both types have the short tumor can be treated with the anti-angiogenesis drug such as Avastin. And remember, Avastin's condition is to limit nutrients, so in a way, mimic hypoxia. And Avastin works in colon cancer very well at the approval. But Avastin treated breast cancer wishy-washy at the year, did not approve it. Genetic is arguing because something was unknown, caused solid tumor in breast cancer does not work on about skin as good as solid, solid tumor colon cancer. What I want to share with you, this study, we went back to TCGA database. ARCO2 overexpression in triple negative breast cancer more than 30%. Colon cancer, very limited. Implying breast cancer may have a a mechanism to cause resistance to capacity. And I'm sorry, breast cancer, a colon cancer doesn't have that. So therefore, in clinical trial, colon cancer, it works. But in breast cancer, it depends which trial. So that's why it which was sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. If that were the case, what we share with you with this mechanism already provide a potential marker for SOLE 393 ARCO2 to be able to identify a subpopulation of breast cancer patients who are likely to be resistant to Avastin and can be treated with a combination therapy between Avastin and TGI. And I have to mention, if you go to literature, tyrosine kinase inhibitor and Avastin in breast cancer clinical trial has been done. But the result is not as clear. Part of the reason I personally get is because you take all the patients to do it. You did not select the population of patients. Because not every patient has this one for sale. What you need to identify that subpopulation of patients who have ARCO2 tyrosine for solation, positive, and that one is the one you want to go to clinical trial. And if you select that population of patients to do the clinical trial, my prediction, the trial will work. That has to get to see. We are interested to go to I think I'm wrong out of time. So actually now I still have one minute time. I'm not going to say anything. I, for those of people who know I'm interested in easier receptor in the nucleus, so it's not going to help get out to say the very last me mechanism. There's a new model now 
or signal transduction. Usually when we say signal transduction, like a receptor, da, 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 signal pathway. Here we have a new model that receptor can translocate from cell service all the way to nucleus or two different compartments, all by membrane associated binding fusion process. So this is each a receptor RB2 or MET receptor tyrosine kind. They never go as a free form, they actually membrane bound step by step endocytosis, fuse to go to, fuse to ER, go to outer nuclear membrane, go to a nuclear pore compound and inner nuclear membrane, then transport to the nucleus. I think this is going to be a, another new way to looking for signal transduction from cell surface to nucleus. And this was done by very uh, many of our postdoc fellow and student as ever, and uh, now we have all this uh, piece together as a very nice signal pathway, although today we don't have time to talk about this detail. So, I always use this as a last slide that to when, when I discovered 20 years ago as a receptor in the nuclear nobody believed me. Even I myself didn't believe too. And my paper has been rejected all the time because nobody believed it. But after 20 years, I think people in the field started to believe it. And I always use this as an example. When, as a scientist, when we look at science, we are like seven blind guys trying to figure out elephant. Seven blind guys, you never seen elephant, you don't touch it. What is that? That's how you interact. We never really know his, the complete story. We can know the complete story only when we work together. So peace together become the element. That's what I wanted to share. Very last time to share with everybody. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.